Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. If you're enjoying this legal edu con education content, please remember to subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. For today's case, we are dealing with a defamation case and anti-slap. This is the case from the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in the case of Rosalind La Liberté versus Joy Reid. In this case, a person spoke up at a California hearing public hearing regarding some sanctuary laws that were being proposed or considered, and they were uh, defamed. Their, their image was raked over the coals by other people who didn't like what they had to say. So this person has sued for the defamation, and, has, and there's been an invocation of anti-slap. And so one of the interesting things is because this is in federal court, whether the state anti-slap law even applies at all. So we get to learn a little bit about defamation, we get to learn a little bit about public figure, and we get to learn about how anti-slap does or does not play in the federal court system. Let's get started with this. The plaintiff, Rosalind La Liberté, spoke at a 2018 city council meeting to oppose California's sanctuary state law. So she's not a fan and she'd like to speak up against it, as one might do, as was famously put in the painting of Norman Rockwell's freedom of speech with the guy standing up at the city council to speak his piece at a public hearing. But apparently some of the people involved in this have not seen Norman Rockwell's freedom of speech painting because they reacted to it with less civility than Norman Rockwell was hoping for. So what happened here? Not Norman Rockwell, but instead a social media activist posed a photo showing the plaintiff with an open mouth in front of a minority teenager. The caption was that persons unnamed had yelled specific racist remarks at the young man in the photo. So that she wrote should, that the person, who is Liberté, yelled racism. The defendant, Joy Reid, a personality on cable television, retweeted that post, an act that is not alleged to be defamatory. The defamation claim is based on Reid's two later posts. Her June 29th post showing the photograph and attributed the specific racist remarks to La Liberté and her July the 1st post to the same effect, juxtaposing the photograph with a 1957 image of a white woman in Little Rock screaming execrations at a black child trying to go to school. All right, so yeah, this is decidedly not what Raymond not, uh, Norman Rockwell had in mind. So this woman is not a huge fan of the sanctuary laws of California. These laws, generally speaking, uh, uh, require state authorities not to cooperate with immigration, which as we've covered many, 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 many times on this channel, is perfectly proper under principles of federalism. We have talked about anti-commandeering, right? So the states don't have to help, but they can't interfere. So if the state says, well, we're not gonna help, we're not gonna report to state authorities or federal authorities, I apologize, that's something they can do. The federal government can't make them, totally fine. That being the case, however, a person could oppose them, right? As you might oppose anything that this government can do, even if they can. So yeah, the government can do this, but someone said, I don't want you to do this, which seems like a per perfectly reasonable thing. So then someone took a photo of her, and then this wonderful cable personality, Joy Reid, decided to take it and augment it. So they, they first of all, identified the person who, ra who said that was racist was this person, and then juxtaposed this photo with another photo of a white woman screaming at a black child trying to go to school. So apparently trying to say that this is equally bad or something. So we're thinking some defamation here, maybe. All right. The teenager who was photographed with La Liberté soon after publicly explained that La Liberté did not scream at him and that they were having a civil discussion. So the person who took the photo said that this person was screaming. The person in the photo said, no, they weren't screaming. We were having a perfectly civil discussion. So way to go there. La Liberté then sued Reed for defamation for this stuff in New York. Okay. We begin with the procedural issue posed by this court's decision to strike La Liberté's defamation claim under California's anti-slap statute. So there was a decision that the claim should be dismissed under anti-slap. For a category of reasons related to a defendant's speech, the statute states that any claim to dismiss, unless the court determines that plaintiffs have established that there is a probability the plaintiff will prevail in the claim. Many states have enacted these anti-slap statutes with the idea they provide breathing room for free speech on contentious public issues. Specifically, California's anti-slap statute was enacted to provide an efficient procedural mechanism 
for the early and inexpensive dismissal of non-meritorious claims arising out of any act of the defendant in furtherance of the person's right a petition of free speech in connection with a public issue. California courts resolve these motions in two steps. First, the court decides where the defendant has made a threshold showing that the challenged cause of action is one arising from a protected activity, such as acts taken in furtherance of defendant's right a petition or free speech. Our sister circuit split on whether federal courts may entertain the various state iterations of anti-slap special motions. The 5th, 11th, and D.C. circuits hold that they're inapplicable in federal courts on the ground that conflict with Federal Rules of Civil Procedure number 12 and number 56. Okay, so we can touch on the issue now dealing with whether or not state anti-slap laws apply in federal court. So the first thing is what I just said, right? They are passed as a creature of state law. There is no federal anti-slap. There probably should be. Then we would have, wouldn't have this question as much. But they, they exist in every state, and they exist differently in every state as a state-level mechanism. So as every law student knows, or every law student will remember, all I have to do is say one word, eerie, eerie, and every law student in the world knows instantly exactly what I'm talking about. See, it's great because we communicate in shorthand. Today's word is eerie. Yes. So as we all learned from Erie, when a federal court is hearing state matters, they apply state substantive law, but they do not apply state procedural law. They apply federal procedural law. Yeah. So these state procedural laws, the question is, do they apply in the federal system or not? And there is a division of opinion, not for the least of reasons, because different states write them differently. And sometimes the courts think that they're substantive or they're quasi-substantive. There's a lot of division of opinion. It's really annoying. When you have lots of different states writing lots of different statutes and lots of different courts interpreting it, they come up with wildly inconsistent results, as you would understand. So either the Supreme Court at some points needs to fix this or Congress needs to fix this or something. But yeah, so you, the state anti-slap law may or may not apply depending on your state and depending on what federal circuit you're in. So yeah, yeah. How, 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 how many, how many people had flashbacks? How many people had flashbacks, like some sort of PTSD trigger? How many people had a PTSD trigger flashback the moment I said eerie? Yeah, I bet he gets more than sub. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, yeah. How many people had a PTSD trigger just from hearing the word? The test is whether a state procedural rule, or at least the anti-slap rule, would apply is whether a federal rule of civil procedure answers the same question as a special motion to strike. If so, the federal rule governs unless it violates the Rule Enabling Act. Applying that test, we first conclude the special motion to strike in California's anti-slap statutes answers the same question as the federal rule, which means the federal rule wins because federal rules always win, so that the anti-slap doesn't apply because it's complicated. It also conflicts with Rule 56, which permits summary judgment only if the movement shows there's no genuine dispute as to any material fact and the movement is entitled to a judgment as a matter of law. Reed urged us to follow the Ninth Circuit, which holds that California's anti-slap statute and the federal rules can exist side by side without conflict. Okay, so having discussed how anti-slap laws do or do not apply in federal court, we must now turn to the issue of defamation and what constitutes defamation in this context. So were these statements defamatory? And if so, why? Is this person a public figure because they spoke up at a meeting? Or are they a private person? What is the standard to be applied? And did the court below get the right standard? Let's discuss. The district court ruled that La Liberté was a limited purpose public figure on the California sanctuary state controversy and dismissed her claim as to the June 29th post for failure to plead actual malice. Um, there are two kinds of public figures. The all-purpose public figure has achieved such pervasive fame or notoriety that he or she will become a public figure for all purposes. The limited-purpose public figure voluntarily injects himself or herself or is drawn into a controversy, thereby becoming a public figure on a range of issues. No one argues that La Liberté is an all-purpose public figure. The question is whether she has become a limited-purpose figure with respect to the California sanctuary state law. So as we're noting here, we have two general classes of public figure, one who's public for all purposes, the most notable people, and ones who are only notable for specific reasons. And so the question is, is she a public person 
because of her injection into a public debate. Uh, and they say it here. It is, did she thrust herself into the forefront of a controversy, invite attention and comment, and assume special prominence? So did her participation by standing up at uh, standing up at her town hall meeting and did her argument with the other person mean that she's a limited purpose public figure? The district court answered these in the affirmative because La Liberté attended and spoke about SB 54 at multiple city council meetings and appeared in a photograph in the Washington Post about the controversy one month before the Simi Valley Council meeting. That is not nearly enough. Thin as the findings are to begin with, the district court did not take into account the requirement that a limited purpose public figure maintain regular and continuing access to the media. One reason for imposing actual mouse burns on public figures and limited purpose public figures is that they have media access enabling them to effectively defend their reputations in the public arena. So one of the things that the court is pointing out here is that one of the tests for public figure status is your ability to have continuing access to media. So whether or not you have a platform for yourself. So if I'm a lim so this test might suggest that I'm a limited purpose public figure, although there are other things that might suggest against it. But at least it's one thing that might trigger that, because presumably as long as YouTube doesn't censor me, I have access to a media channel to defend myself. So, yay. But this person didn't have that, so it didn't really work. So, yeah. La Liberté plainly lacks such media access. The earlier photograph which showed her conversing was in a Washington Post photo spread of attendees at a protest. The article did not name her, let alone mention her views. The single caption described everyone depicted as supporters and opponents of rallying and debating outside Los Alamos City Hall. Such incidental and anonymous treatment hardly respects regular and continuing access to the media. Nor does La Liberté's participation at city council meetings. La Liberté is said to have testified eight times around the state, but Reed does not identify instances in which the media singled out La Liberté's participation as newsworthy. Nor does speech, even a lot of it, make a citizen or non-citizen fair game for attack. Imposition of actual malice requirement on people who speak out of government meetings would chill public participation in policy and community dialogue. It makes little sense to deem La Liberté a limited purpose public figure when she stepped forward solely to defend her reputation. People become limited purpose public figures only when they voluntarily invite comment and criticism by injecting themselves into public controversies. Since La Liberté was not a limited purpose public figure, the district court erred by requiring her to allege actual malice and her claims as to the June 29th post should not have been dismissed for failure to do so. On remand, the district court may assess whether La Liberté adequately alleged that Reed acted negligently with respect to the post, which is the standard for private figure plaintiffs. So you do have to make at least negligence for defamation, and whether or not they were negligent is a question to be decided. So we discussed so far a limited purpose public figure and uh, by proxy, at least, public pur public purpose, public figure, someone who injects himself into controversy and public debate on a public issue is a public figure, and this person didn't do it. Uh, so as a result, the right standard is negligence. But of course, for it to be defamation, it also has to be a fact. It has to be a false fact. So one of the questions might be, is this a statement of fact or a statement of opinion that's non-actionable? So let's get started with that analysis. The district court dismissed La Liberté's claim as to the July 1st post on the ground that expressed a non-actionable statement of opinion. A reader could have understood the July 1st post as equating La Liberté's conduct with archetypal racist conduct, which is a provable assertion of fact and is therefore actionable. Okay, so this is, this is interesting because it gets into the idea of what exactly makes a statement of opinion, what makes something a statement of fact, and this can get questionable. So, for example, does saying some, is saying someone a racist a statement of fact or a statement of opinion? Can it be proven to be true or not true? And more of the and so maybe maybe not. But this what this court is saying that this is conduct because the racist conduct in question would presumably be the shouting in the face, which didn't happen. So maybe that's the problem. But whether or not this is opinion or not, it's pretty complicated. This court says it's not opinion, which is a which is a reasonable opinion, but the alternative uh, might also be reasonable. But this is a court of appeals and they say this is opinion, this is fact. But I don't think you can read this as saying every time someone says racist makes it fact. Because I know there are opinions that say different things. So, you know, it's going to be going to be questionable. Your mileage will vary on this one for sure. Whether a statement is not actual opinion is a question of law to be decided by the court. The test is whether a reasonable fact finder could conclude 
the published statement declares or implies a provably, provably false assertion of fact. Can you prove it theoretically? How would you go about that? Yeah, so there's problems there. Readers who are unfamiliar with the June 29 post could still interpret the July 1st post to mean that Liberté engaged in racist conduct. The Little Rock encounter is a matter of common knowledge, rationally attributable to all reasonable persons. This is the, uh, the one looking at the more famous incident from history where the woman shouting at the person going to school. So they, they say the court, uh, that's well enough known to be assumed to be within the, the common knowledge. Far from an obscure episode, it is a landmark event in one of the most vital historic developments of the 20th century, and the 1957 photograph is an indelible image of it. Presumably, that is why and how Reed used it. Moreover, even with those with impoverished fame of Raymer reference could interpret the post as accusing La Liberté of engaging in a racist conduct. There was no need for extrinsic aid beyond a reader's own intelligence and common sense. The 1957 photograph shows a white woman screaming at a black child with her face twisted in rage. When viewing that image next to La Liberté's photograph and reading Reed's comment that history sometimes repeats, a reader could believe La Liberté had likewise engaged in Rice's conduct, and Reed is liable for whatever it insinuated as well as for what's stated explicitly. So fair enough. So first of all, this is really, really well known. And even if you don't know this particular image, which, you know, maybe you don't because you can't know everything, but you should be able with just common sense, which I know is lacking, but let's pretend it's not. You should be able with just common sense, figure out what this image is. This is a white woman screaming at a black child with her face twisted. Obviously, there's some racial overtones there, even if you don't know what it's referring to. So then figuring that out, you would then juxtapose it with the other image and say, aha, it's particularly because it said history repeats itself, that this is part and parcel of the same thing. So this person engaged in clearly reprehensible conduct, so, so forth, this person. That was the point of you making the comparison. Or so the court at least thinks it's arguable. These are all tribal questions, at least. So that's why the court is saying that it's not actionable opinion. Be or apologize. Let me try it again. That's why the court is saying that it is a fact or arguably a fact. Because you could prove or disprove that this is similar or, or of the same ilk or whatever. So, yeah, that makes it tribal. That's what this court thinks. A different court could see this a different way. I can see that for sure. But yeah, because these, these lines get very blurry. But that's what this court seems to think. So okay for the moment. Since the district court concluded that La Liberté adequately alleged malice with respect to the July 1st post, it follows that La Liberté adequately alleged negligence, the standard for private figures. Her claim to the post should proceed to discovery. Thus, that brings us to the end of the discussion of the case of Rosalind La Liberté versus Joy Reid. In this case, we learned that La Liberté spoke up against the California sanctuary laws at multiple different town and city meetings, which, you know, she presumably has a right to do. And at one of these meetings, she was photographed um, with her mouth open talking to a black person. And they labeled her a racist for yelling, but she wasn't yelling. So says the person in the photo. And then another person, Reed, put this out with this photo and said, sometimes history repeats itself and juxtaposed it with an image from 1950s with a woman yelling at a black child trying to go to school. So the court says, yeah, this is at least arguable to a jury. Now, what a jury will or will not believe, who knows? But this is at least arguable so it can proceed to discovery. The anti-slap isn't a relevant issue because of uh, federal law. And that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.